Everyone has questions. Why am I here? Where will I go when I die? Is there really truth? But not everyone has biblical answers. Welcome to The Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study the Bible to draw closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is Pastor Tom Brock. Welcome to The Pastor's Study. How our tongues can get us into trouble and others into trouble. In the 1700s in New England, there was a young man by the name of David Brainerd. He really wanted to become a pastor. He goes to Yale University, which was Christian back then, and trained Christian pastors. But he was overheard telling a, f a fellow student, our instructor has no more grace than a chair. <laughs> it got back to the administration. He was expelled from Yale, broke his heart, but went on to become a missionary. He died early. I think he was only 28 when he died, but his biography has inspired people for many years. But how our tongue can get us into trouble and get others into trouble. One of my earliest memories, I was six years old. If my brother or I said a bad word, mom would take us into the bathroom with an ivory soap bar and wash our mouths out with soap. I was six years old, my brother was five, we're running around the house, my brother runs around the corner and says, oh hell. I went right to mom. Mom, Mark said hell. Mom took into the bathroom, she took out the ivory soap, and I can remember my brother coming out of the bathroom crying. All I said was hello. <laughs> so we're going to talk about taming the tongue today. And um, you've heard of John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church, rode on horseback all over England preaching the gospel. And this is back when the preachers would wear these ties with the long ribbons. So after a sermon one day, a woman came up. Uh, Reverend Wesley, I couldn't hear a word of your sermon because the, the ribbons are too long on your tie. So Wesley said, anybody got a scissors? And he handed her the scissors. Okay, madam, cut them the way you like them. And she did. And then he said, and madam, could you stick out your tongue? Why? Well, I find it much too long and sharp. <laughs> you know, I, that's a story I read in a book. Who knows if he really said it. But how our tongues can get us into trouble. So what I want us to do today is take a look at a passage of Scripture about how we need to tame the tongue. Would you turn in the book, uh, in the New Testament, to the book of Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writing to the Christians in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 4, and let's pray first. Father, we pray that you would help us use our tongues for good and not for evil. Lord, we would pray that you'd speak to us now about how to tame our tongue. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 25. Therefore, lay aside falsehood. Speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Here's the first lesson. My mouth must speak truth, is what it says. So I'm at dinner with some Christian friends, and uh, at halfway through, the waitress comes out. How, how do you like the food? Everything good? Oh, it's great, great. And, they left. and she left, and I said, do you really think the food here is so great? Oh, no. Well, didn't you just lie? <laughs> you ever been at home, and the phone rings, and maybe your kid answers it, and uh, Mom, it's for you. Well, tell them I'm not home. Well, isn't that a lie? I have a good friend who's a pastor. He and I were sitting in his house one day talking. His wife comes in from the hairdresser with a real short haircut. Oh, honey, how do you like my haircut? And he said, oh, it's, I like it. It's nice. And she left, and I said, did you really like that haircut? No. I said, well, didn't you just lie? And he said, oh, Brock, you're not married. You don't understand. Well, wait a minute. Isn't it still a lie? The Bible says we're supposed to speak truth with our tongues. The, also, the Bible says, speak the truth in love. Now, there's a balance. We're supposed to speak the truth. 
but we're supposed to speak it in love. Some people have no trouble speaking the truth, but they speak it with a sledgehammer. Other people have no problem speaking in a loving way, but they never get around to telling people the truth. We're supposed to do both. We're supposed to speak the truth in love. Well, years ago, I got a letter from the Minneapolis Council of Churches. It's the liberal group of like the liberal Presbyterians, Lutherans, Methodists, United Church of Christ. It's a group that, no offense, but I, I just do not respect where they stand. A lot of heresy going on in those churches. So I got a letter saying that they wanted me to give them money. And don't you love it when this happens at the bottom of the page? And we'll be calling you in a few days to hear of your decision. Ooh. So I got a phone call a few days later from the head of this group or one of their members of their board, I think. Would you like to donate to the Minneapolis Council of Churches? And I could have just said, no, I can't afford it this year. But I thought maybe I, not maybe, I got to tell them the truth. I said, you know, no offense, but I got to tell you, I just, I think so much of what you stand for is against scriptures. I can't give you money. I know of a church and their staff, when they have staff meetings, sometimes they'll say to each other, can I go the last 10% with you? Meaning, can I tell you the whole truth? It might hurt a little bit, but it's for your good. We need to lovingly, humbly go the last 10% with people and tell them the truth. Look at verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. Here's the next lesson. My mouth can express anger, but not sinful anger. It says in that verse, be angry. So nothing's wrong. It's not a sin to be angry. It's not a sin to say, look, you hurt my feelings, and I'm hurt, and I'm angry about this. That's okay to do, but you can't let it become sin. The way you express anger can, can be the sin. So here's a pastor who's pounding nails on, on boards in the backyard making a fence. The little neighbor boy next, day is, next door is right next to the pastor watching all this. And finally the pastor says, little boy, something, can I help you? <laughs> yeah, I want to hear what the pastor says when he hits his thumb with the hammer. <laughs> Nothing's wrong with being angry, with being hurt, and expressing it. It's the way you express it that can become sin. Proverbs 29 says this, A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man holds it back. So one day I was at the church shaking hands after the worship service. Here comes through a man who just lets into me, right, right at the door in front of people, just lets me have it. And then, he, and then he went somewhere else in the church, and I shake the rest of the hands, and I hate this kind of stuff, but I, I hunted him down, found him in church, I said, Jerry, should we sit down and talk about this? And he allowed that, and we talked it out, but don't do that to people. On a different day, a dear woman of our church calls me up. Pastor Brock, I have a concern. Can I come in and talk to you about it? I said, sure. She came into my office. She sat down. Can we pray first? Oh, Lord, please help me do this right. I just want to say what I need to say. And she, she had a criticism about me. She was so wonderful, so loving, so humble about it. I couldn't help but listen to what she said. So can I give you some advice? <laughs> if you have to confront your pastor about something, don't write him an angry letter. I mean, I've gotten those and they sit in your lap and, Lord, what do I do with this one? But just instead call him up and say, can we sit down and talk? I just have a concern. That's so much better. Look at verse 29. Let no rotten word proceed out of your mouth but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment that it may give grace to those who hear. Here's the next lesson. My mouth must build up, not tear down. There's a saying, parents, for every one time you criticize your child, compliment them twice. I, uh, I'm on, periodically I'm on a Christian radio show, it's called Guy Talk Thursday, and we have a little group of maybe four guys, and we talk about the Christian life and current events and all this stuff, and we, we joke with each other, and the other day, one of, one of the guys said something, and boy, did I have a zinger to come back with. 
but I had to go and bite my tongue because I have friends who say to me periodically, Tom, negative humor, meaning your humor is funny, but it can tear people down and, and, and not build people up. So I got to watch my negative humor. And, and so we need to build people up with our words. You know, there's a saying that um, sometimes uh, in humor, anger comes out sideways. Meaning, instead of you saying, you know, you should do this, or I'm hurt by this, you make a joke about it, and it comes out sideways. So, build people up with your humor, and I'm talking to me. <laughs> Years ago, I worked with a dear Christian man. He was the senior pastor, and I was his associate. And one day he made a joke about me in front of other people. It didn't bother me at all. But the next day he came to me, oh, Tom, I couldn't sleep last night. I hope I didn't hurt your feelings with that joke. I never should have said that. And I said to him, no, it was okay. But you know what I thought to myself? There is a man with a tender conscience. We need to have a tender conscience and be careful about our words. Build people up. Don't tear them down with your humor. I think one of the most moving scenes in a motion picture is from Elephant Man. There's a movie called Elephant Man, a true story about a man who was horribly deformed. He was kept in a cage so people could see him at freak shows and then finally he escaped and finally he became ultimately a lecturer, but he was horribly deformed from head to toe. But there's a beautiful scene, he's a famous man by the end of the movie, there's a beautiful scene when he's, before he dies that uh, a famous actress comes to his home and puts her hand on his ugly face and says, oh, I don't think you're an elephant man at all. And he says, I'm not. No, you're a beautiful human being. And you see a tear come down his cheek and I started to cry and you know one word one sentence can just make somebody's life I, when I was 10 years old I had a teacher by the name of Mrs. Cook best teacher I've ever had I think she looking back on this I think she sensed that I didn't get, get much encouragement as a kid and she would just encourage, I can still remember things that she would say to encourage me. My point is, use your tongue to build people up and not to tear them down. Criticize when you have to, but do it humbly. Because here's what happens if you don't, if you use your mouth in an evil way. Verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Here's the next lesson. A, a rotten mouth will grieve the Holy Spirit. So don't, I mean, uh, just this week, I heard maybe four people, oh my God, don't do that. That's, that's profaning the name of God. And uh, you know, when somebody says, oh, you fool, don't use the word fool. Matthew 5 says you can go to hell for that. Just when you use rotten language, it grieves the Holy Spirit of God. I'll take this for what you think it's worth, but this has happened a number of times. I'm about to say something, and I'll get dizzy, as if to say, don't say that. And, and then I'll think on it, yeah, that really could have hurt that person. <laughs> so, um, there we go. Last, last verse is verse um, 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. And here's the, the last lesson. I must have a forgiving tongue and a tongue that asks for forgiveness. I know a, a, a Christian couple Years ago, I went to another state to visit them, and we uh, had, a, had a good time together. I know the woman more than I know the man, because I've known her since college, and he goes to bed, and his wife and I are sitting in the living room talking, and she tells me that she committed adultery against her husband. And we talked about that, and then I finally said, 
I think you need to talk to him about it. Oh no, no way. Well, months later, I get a phone call from her. You know, Tom, we, we pulled up in the driveway and it was like the Holy Spirit came upon me and I confessed what I had done and I wept and I begged his forgiveness, he forgave me and then he asked my forgiveness for letting his job be his mistress and God has wonderfully healed our marriage. We need to have a forgiving tongue and we need to also have a tongue that asks for forgiveness. And let me explain why. Uh, this is from James chapter 3. The tongue is a fire. The tongue is an unrighteous world among our members, staining the whole body, set on fire by hell. No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who are made in the likeness of God. My brethren, this ought not to be so. Did you catch that? It says no one can tame the tongue. I mean, the other I was I was speaking in front of a group, and I said so, and later I'm kicking myself. Why did I say that? You know why I said it? Because no one can tame the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because no one can tame the tongue, therefore, periodically, I'm going to have to ask forgiveness for the way my tongue slips. One last point. The Bible teaches no one can tame the tongue. But God can. <laughs> so something I pray periodically, I should pray it more often, maybe every day, Lord, would you tame my tongue today? I can't. The Bible says I can't. But God, would you tame my tongue today so that I'll build people up with my tongue rather than tear people down? You know, I heard a joke once that was a very funny joke. And I have never been able to tell that joke again because it was so evil. I mean, I didn't... Somebody told me this joke, very funny joke, but an evil joke. Now, if I wasn't saved, if I wasn't a follower of Christ, I probably would have told that joke a hundred times. But even though it's so funny, I cannot retell that joke because I have a new mouth now. As a believer, yes, I still slip and fall, but there are things I don't say that I used to say. <laughs> and so I, I want to ask you just to do something as I close. Would you close your eyes? Wherever you're at, would you close your eyes? And I want to ask you this week to do one of two things. Number one, can you think of something you said and you need to go to that person and say, will you forgive me? Is something coming to your mind? If it is, obey. Or maybe nothing is coming to your mind, but, or, so would you do number two? Can you think of someone who needs an encouraging word this week? Somebody is going through something and... God wants to use your mouth to build that person up. May you do that this week. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor study where we now ask Pastor Brock to share with us his knowledge of scripture and his insights to answer questions we have regarding the Bible, our Lord, and our everyday walk with him. Pastor Brock, in light of your sermon, my first question is, Am I always obligated to tell someone the whole truth? And nothing but the truth, so help me God. Well, you know, I, sometimes you don't want to hurt people's feelings. Yeah. And I don't think you, I mean, for instance, Jackie, let's say you, you have me over for dinner, and you serve me liver and onions. Ooh. Now, do I have to tell you, you know, I hate liver and onions? Or let's say you serve a different meal, I just don't like it. Am I obligated to tell you I don't like it? No, I'm not. You know, you speak the truth in love is what the Bible says. It doesn't say you have to tell everybody your opinion about everything. I mean, I, Jackie, I like to eat chicken now, but eat when I was younger, I didn't. And so when someone would say to me, Tom, do you like chicken as they're about to serve it? I wouldn't say, I like chicken. That would be a lie. I wouldn't say, uh, that's fine. I, I would say, that will be fine. <laughs> Meaning, I'm going to eat it, but I didn't lie, so I think we can say things without unnecessarily, you know, saying things. <laughs> okay. So, is anger normally a sin then? 
I think it often is. In and of itself, it's not, because the verse we just read said, be angry, but do not sin. But the way we get angry can be sinful. But anger in and of itself, and even expressing anger, is not a sin. Again, it's, it says in that verse, be angry, but do not sin. Okay, well then I've got the next okay. one for you, is that how can I tell if my anger is righteous anger or just sinful anger? Yeah. Well, that verse from Proverbs that I referenced, a fool gives full vent to his anger, a wise man holds it back. So we, we can give vent to our anger, Jackie, but we're just not supposed to give full vent, in meaning I let it come out in any way that I want, foul language, cutting, hurtful words. You, know, you can tell someone the truth that you've been hurt or that you're angry about something without blasting them. Okay. Yeah. Tom, James 1.20 has a, that verse, says, What does the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God? What does that mean? Yeah, James 1.20, the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. And I'll tell you what I think that means. Years ago, I worked for a senior pastor. I was the assistant. He was the senior pastor. And this guy exploded with anger. He lied a lot. He was just a difficult person. And God didn't use him much. But then I went to work for a different senior pastor who loved the Lord, a humble man. Jackie, in my eight years working with that senior pastor, I don't think I saw him angry once. He knew how to keep his... Uh, and God used that man. The anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. I think part of what that means is angry people aren't used much for the kingdom. Humble, loving people are. Yeah. Okay. I think I know which minister it was, Tom. Yes, says, you do. But we won't talk <laughs> about You're a wonderful that. man. Yep. How is it possible for human beings to grieve the Holy Spirit? And the second part of that would be, isn't God above emotions? Uh, no, a God, it says that God loves. It says God gets angry. It, and it says in, in Ephesians chapter 4, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, Jackie, cults like Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe the Holy Spirit is a person, like the Father and the Son are persons. They don't believe the Holy Spirit is a person. They think he's just a force or a, a power. But you cannot grieve a force or a power. You can only grieve a person. So I think uh, Ephesians 4, verse 30, is proof that the Holy Spirit is a person, one of the three persons of the Trinity. Person in the sense, not that there are three human bodies up there, but each has mind, will, and emotions. So yes, you can grieve God and the Holy Spirit. Okay, Tom, I'm going to turn this into a personal thing rather than, say, people or anything. Okay. If I had someone hurt me deeply, and I'm having trouble forgiving them, are there any thoughts on what I should do? Yeah. It's called loving people by faith, in spite of your feelings, in spite of what they've done. And, and here's the way I do this, Jackie. The Bible commands me to forgive people that have hurt me. I'm commanded to do that. And the, Bi and the Bible also tells me that when I pray God's, according to God's will, He hears it and He does it. All right, so Jackie, let's say that uh, some friend of mine really hurts me, or some enemy of mine really hurts me. Uh, this is what I do, I've done it for many years. In prayer I'll say, Lord, I forgive Mr. So-and-so for what he just did. In your strength and power, not in my own because I can't do this, but Holy Spirit, in your strength and power, I forgive Mr. So-and-so for what he did. Amen. And then I might five minutes later be going rrr, 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 in my head about him. Does that mean I haven't forgiven him? No. It just means my feelings and my emotions haven't caught up to that. So I, you know, Jackie, there's some people that are dead who really bugged me. And now and then I'll go rrr, rrr, rrr in my head and I'll say, Lord, thank you. I forgive that person in Jesus' name. I think, I think that's the most healthy thing we can do. Okay. Yeah. Is it always a sin to call someone a fool. I mean, I think that's a word that's being used. Oh, you fool. Or you idiot, or you numbskull. numbskull. You know, all they're all words. the same. I think overwhelmingly it is a sin. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 that you can go to hell for calling somebody a fool. So I never use that word. But that's not to say that it's always a sin. And let me tell you why. In the book of James, James calls some of his uh, 
uh, hearers, fools. In the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul says, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you to, to fall away from the gospel of Christ? So Paul and James calls people fools. So I'm not saying there's never a time for it, and there might be a time when uh, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, God might have you call somebody a fool, but overwhelmingly, I wouldn't do it because of Matthew chapter 5. <laughs> you know, people take some of those words and just think, oh, you foolish, right. you know. Yeah. And it's not right. <laughs> no, it isn't. If someone's hurt me by their words, do I need to talk to them about it or... What should a person do? I mean, sit uh -huh. there and stew or... Right. I mean, Jackie, let's say that you say something to me, and it kind of hurts my feelings. And, la and later in the day, oh, Lord, I forgive Jackie for what she said. Sometimes you just let it go. Because the Bible, the Proverbs does say it's a glory for a man to overlook a fault. But on the other hand, Jackie, if five days from now I'm still thinking... <laughs> Maybe that's God saying, you know, Tom, you need to go to Jackie and say, look, you said this, and that hurt my feelings. So I think if you can't let it go, sometimes it's good to go and confront the person. You know, I think if I hurt somebody's feelings and didn't know I was doing it, I would rather they did come Absolutely. to me. Absolutely. And Ab I think most people yep. would be like that. And, you know, Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. We're supposed to rebuke each other. I'm just saying you can't do it for every single word that anybody ever says. You know, there's a balance to this. <laughs> Tom, we're down to just a minute. Is oh, we there are. anything you'd like to say? Yeah, everybody, thanks for watching our show. And uh, we are coming to you because of your generous support. We're on all over the country now because of your, your gifts. More than anything, pray for us. We've had a lot of health problems in our volunteers this year, so would you just pray for God's protection over our ministry and over each of our volunteers and that God would use this program to speed the gospel around the world. Also, if you want to watch this show again, all of our TV shows you can watch for free at pastorstudy.org, and right there is the thing right there. So just go to pastorstudy.org, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching The Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the gospel of Christ because of our generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org. Or write The Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always. If you've been blessed by the pastor's study, would you consider a tax-deductible gift to help us reach more people with the good news of Jesus Christ? You can donate at our website, pastorsstudy.org, two S's, or mail a check to the pastor's study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55441. May the Lord bless you and have a wonderful week.